Jesus. God is good. Amen. You know, I think that so many times we're so caught up with the neg negativity that goes on in our life that we forget to thank God for the simple things that are so important to us. A lot of times people say you don't know what you got until it's gone. And that's true. You don't know what you got until it's gone. A lot of times people want to shun hard times. People don't want to go through hard times. People don't want to go through sickness. People don't want to go through tragedy. But if we're really honest with ourselves, what do we learn in victory? We don't learn nothing because we're already there. But when we go through trials and we are with Jesus, those trials refine us they teach us, they remind us that we're, that we're nothing without Jesus. They remind us that we are weak individuals. They remind us that we can be broken. And what does it do? It causes us to reach out in faith more to grab a hold of Jesus. It causes us to press in deeper. And how many of you know that God honors the prayers of someone who is desperate more than someone who is just lackadaisically saying, eh, I'll pray, Lord, but if you do it, you do it. If you don't, you don't. See, that's not passion, but Lord, the Lord loves passion. When you're broken, when you hit rock bottom, when you know you have nowhere else to go, and you're like, Jesus, I need you now, or else I'm going to die. I need you now, otherwise I'm going to lose my mind. When we get desperate for Jesus, we begin to see the move of the Holy Spirit. Amen? It's important. The Bible says all things work to the good. But them who love the Lord have been called according to his purpose. So let me just encourage everyone today that anybody in here that's going through something right now, whether it be physical, whether it be financial, whether it be um, something in your family, there's something going on mentally, whatever it is, give it to Jesus. Submit to him. Ask the Holy Spirit to come in so that he can teach us what we need to learn from these situations and so he can show us how we can have victory over it in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Grace Team. Thank you, guys. You may be seated. God is just too good. Some of the proof is, look at the weather we've been having out there, guys. Wow, the weather's awesome, isn't it? Let's, let's, let's do a quick survey here, because I know there is some of you guys out there. Who, out, who in here are the rare birds that are just like, they're, you're like, it could be winter all year long and I'd be happy. Anybody, anybody here just like a total winner person? All right, Shane, okay, we got a few. All right, now who in here is the spring people? You're like, yo, as long as it stood like spring, I would be good. Now who in here is weird like me and you're like summer all year long, I can take it. Yeah, that's me, okay. God is good, I've been, I've been enjoying this weather. As a matter of fact, I just like sitting is that, you guys can tell me, I, I've never, I never used to do that, so I don't know if it's a, if it's a sign that I'm, that I'm aging, guys, but I like to sit out on my porch in the sun and just stare at people in cars and stuff, and people tell me, you never used to do that before, and I'm like, well, I find it enjoyable now. I like to just sit there and stare, and I'm, you know, and I'm not being nosy. I'm, I'm actually a very polite neighbor that when the neighbors start throwing stuff around their house, I get up and kindly go inside until they're done, and then I go back out so they don't think I'm spying on them or something, you know? But we've been blessed with this weather. I love it, you know? And uh, what a better time right now to go out there and begin to prepare things, begin to prepare our yards, and begin to prepare, prepare things for summer. And just like so, as we see seasons changing, it's always a reminder that it's time for us to prepare our hearts, to pray, to have the Holy Spirit prepare us for what's coming next, right? During the winter time, it's a lot, it's a, it's a lot of staying inside. During this last year, it's been a lot of staying inside. And I honestly think that... Um, Though uh, necessary in some, in some way, shape, or form, I think the quarantines have crushed people's spirits. There's a lot of depressed people out there. There's a lot of hurting people out there. There's a lot of people that have gotten so comfortable being at home and not going to church, not going to visit familia, not going out and volunteering in places where they used to volunteer, the food shelter, other places. You know what? We've got to get out of our comfort zone, right? If you're healthy enough, Get out of your comfort zone. Begin to move in the Lord. Begin to let God use you. It's so important, man. It's so important we stay active for God because the more we stray away from doing what we do for the Lord, the more easy it is to get lazy and stay away. And then what happens? We begin to see decay in our spiritual life. Amen? That's all I'm going to say about that. But today, we're going to continue on week two of our Holy Spirit series. And just like last week, 
just like last week, I got to be very careful that I don't go jump into next week's sermon, okay? Because I really, I really had a hard time because there were so many places in here that I could jump into next week's sermon. And so next week, we're going to get into some real heavy stuff. And that's how the Holy Spirit exposes sin to us and deals with some of the dark things in our lives that he needs to pull up, uproot, expose for us to grow in Christ. So that's next week. So if you start seeing me begin to go in there too much, y'all can just wave at me and be like, yo, don't take all the notes for next week, Dave. Even though I think if we hear it twice, it's not a big deal, right? I think we all need it. Um, so today, we're going to read out of John, our, our main text is out of John 16, verse 12 through 15. You remember last week, we shared a little bit about the Holy Spirit and a little bit about who he was and a little bit about how he, how he was sent to be our comforter. Well, this week, we're focusing on discernment. We're focusing on how he helps us and how he's here to lead us in the truth in reference to studying your word, in reference to understanding the things of God. Amen? So if you have John 16, 12 through 15, say amen. Okay, we're going to read this. And this is, uh, he says, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. This is Jesus talking to the disciples. He said, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. However, when he, the spirit of truth, notice what he called the Holy Spirit right here. The spirit of truth has come. He will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. And he will tell you things to come. He will glorify me, and he will take of what is mine and declare it to you. All things that the Father has are mine. Therefore, I said that he will take of mine and declare it to you. So we, right away, we notice something really interesting in that verse is that, is that the Holy Spirit is here. He, we read like we did last week. He's our comforter. He's our helper. He, there's so many different functions that are there. But he, he's, the, Jesus told them right then and there, he said, there's some things that I need to share with you, but you're not ready for them. Okay? Now, of course, I cannot do this any kind of uh, justice as there's so many expository sermons that you could preach off of God's will and everything else. So I'm just giving you a very condensed idea. That way you can have a little bit of uh, foresight before we go into the rest of it. But Jesus was telling them, you don't know what's coming. You're not ready for it. So I'm sending you a helper that will prepare your hearts for it. Well, what was Jesus talking about? He was talking about what the disciples were going to go through. Because we know that all the disciples were martyred except for one, right? And that was, that was John. That was the one that wrote the book of Revelation, right? And it's not that they didn't try to kill the guy. They tried to kill him twice. On two different occasions, they tried to kill John, but they couldn't. So what did they do? They kicked him to the island of Patmos to do hard labor until he died, right? So I, I wouldn't say that, that he exactly had it easier than everyone else, but he did. But he was there to fulfill what God needed him to fulfill, and that was to write the book of Revelation, to listen and to give the people the warning, to give the people what was coming. But Jesus said, you're not ready for this yet. So can you imagine if Jesus would have walked up to the disciples right at that moment they had been with Jesus their whole life, or not their whole life, they had been with Jesus for their whole ministry, and, uh, and they had seen so many miracles, they relied on Jesus, he was their leader, and of course there's anxiety and everything because, because God, you know, they knew that Jesus was crucified, they knew what was going on. Can you imagine if he would have walked up and just like really just laid it out and been like, listen, Peter, you're going to be crucified upside down, right? And he just goes down the list, you're going to die a terrible death. Guys, you're going to get beaten to death, Right? Uh, you're going to be stoned to death. You're going to be stoned to death, right, Stephen? You're going to be... Can you imagine if he would have just laid it out and just told everyone all the trials and the things that were... These guys, some of the guys might have been like, oh, Jesus, we didn't sign up for this. Right? So that's why Jesus said, I'll leave you a helper, and he will lead you into all truth. He will help you. He will prepare your spirit to be able to go through what you go through. Why? Because our strength is in the Lord, right? It's not I can do all things through myself who strengthens me, or I can do all things through Oprah Winfrey, or I can do all things through my favorite talk show host, or this guy or that guy. It's I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. It's Jesus Christ that gives us strength. And he uses his Holy Spirit to speak to us, to comfort us, to guide us. And so as he told them this, he leaves it. The Holy Spirit comes in. And we know how that works. We know that they're filled with the Holy Spirit. We know that, that, that uh, the Apostle Paul does his job, right? He begins to baptize people. They're filled with the Holy Spirit. We know that, that there's great moves of God that happen. But as they go on with their Christian walk, and as the Holy Spirit is in them, 
and guides them, their minds open up to what they're about to go through. And what happens? When they hit those points of heavy persecution, or when, they're, or when they're getting ready to go, they're ready. And they're not fearful. Why? Because Jesus is with them. They're filled with the Holy Spirit. You see, in our own flesh, can any of us be that strong? No. All of us, I can say that honestly, all of us would be scared out of our mind if someone, if someone came and said right now, listen, you're going to serve God and you're going to be bold for God? You're going to die in three years. They're going to kill you. A lot of people would be like, whoa, don't want to do it no more. Don't want to serve God. But is God's will not greater than ours? You see, we want God to use us, and we want to do the radical things for God, and we want God to change our families, but we don't want to sacrifice. Lord, do all the good stuff and give us all your blessings, but I don't want to go through none of the pain. Well, that is totally unrealistic. If you want to serve Jesus... If you want to see God do miracles in your life, if you want to see God bless people and bring people to God, you need to know that you're going to go through turmoil. You need to know that you're going to be persecuted. You need to know that the enemy is going to come against you. But if you have the Holy Spirit inside of you, then you can be at comfort knowing that God is going to be with you every step of the way and that you're not by yourself. Listen, let me just say this, and I say it often. But let's be real. In a day and age where churches will sit there and they'll tell you about how, how blessed you're going to be and how rich God wants to make you and how this and how if you walk with God, you're going to walk in this, in this supernatural where you're never going to go through uh, sickness. or anything. Listen, that's, Maybe there's a few people that have the blessing of being able to go through that, but that's not it. If you're going to walk with Jesus, you're going to be persecuted. You're going to get beat. Your body's going to be battered and bruised. But guess what? This world is not our final destination. Right? We are strangers. We are, what did Jesus say? We are not of this world. Right? He said that if we were of this world, they would have accepted us. But because we're not of this world, they would reject us just like they rejected him. And when it comes to pain, doesn't the Bible say that? Are you greater than the master? Is a servant greater than the master? Well, the master was crucified, beaten, flesh hanging off of his back beaten to an inch of his life and crucified for our sins. What makes us think that, we don't, that, that we're not going to go through pain? That we're not going to go through sorrow? We need to be really realistic about what we do. Because every time I say this, and I, you guys hear me say this often, I always, I always say this, and, when, and to you guys it's different because you guys know it, but when I say it to new crowds, it's always, a, it's always a, uh, an interesting reaction because you always hear how many of you guys will live for Jesus? Or how many of you guys would die for Jesus, right? And everyone's like, I'll die for Jesus. And I'll be like, how many of you guys live for Jesus right now? And the hands are down. we got to understand that God will bless you. God will heal you. God will bring you through situations. God will make you victorious. But it's going to be a battle. Yep. It, the, the sooner that everybody gets the rope, the... The, the, the TV romanticizing of how ministry is out of their mind, the better off you're going to be. Oh, it's going to be great. I'm going to walk in such authority. Nothing's ever going to happen to me, and I'm going to conquer all, and everything's going to be handed to me. No, it's not. We're going to get out there, and we're going to plow those fields. And we're going to fall flat on our face at times. I will tell you guys that so many times, and to this day, I fall flat on my face because at times, I lean on my own understanding. At times, I get lost in Dave's opinion. And guess what? Dave's opinion doesn't matter to Jesus. Right? He listens to me in love, but the truth is the word of God. That's the truth. And without the word of God and without submitting to it fully, we cannot move in what we want. You see, we want everything to be easy with us. I don't, I don't exactly know when it started. Maybe Brother Amos and Brother Leonard, do you guys remember when about what years the doctrine of prosperity started? I don't remember... It was a while back, and, and, and that was uh, that came along with the name and claimant movement and everything to where it was, God's going to bless you, bless you, bless you, bless you, bless you, bless you. Well, God desires to bless us more than we desire to be blessed, but we're going to go through stuff. I really want to hammer that home because so many people want to enter ministry, and they don't realize you're going to sacrifice everything. You need to be willing to sacrifice everything, right? And guess what? All of you are called to ministry. <coughs> yeah. Pastor's just a I don't like titles. All of you are called to ministry. We're called to minister to those people that are our job, our families, our families first, our friends, our neighbors. All of us have been given a little group of people that the Lord's like, get loose, cut loose. You can do it. You know why? I can't reach them. But you can. 
You know why? You have a relationship with them. They already love you. They already trust you. And so you can do that. So the Lord wants us to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit so we know how to move, so we know what to do, so that we're not easily deceived, and so that we understand that when, when we're out there doing things for God and the pain comes against us and, and the trials and the tribulations, we don't get offended. We don't get mad. We don't shake a finger at God, but we say, Lord, thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Teach me what you're trying to teach me through this situation. Help me to learn, God. Humble me. I submit to you, God. If I'm doing something wrong and this is a form of chastisement, good father, just show me. Show me what to do. How many of you guys know that a good father will discipline his children? He does. And it's so important that we submit to that discipline. Amen? See, the Gospel of John was likely written in the latter half of the first century. And that's when Gnosticism had already been making its inroads into the Roman Empire, okay? The word Gnosticism comes from the word Greek that means knowledge. It goes a little bit deeper with what they believe. It's kind of like a big mashup of a lot of different things. But Gnosticism in itself is to rely on knowledge. And we know the Greeks, they really relied on knowledge. And it was like a lot about what I know as opposed to, uh, you know, how you live and how you act it out. And so the Apostle Paul was fighting with that during this time of a lot of this Gnostic belief. And everyone always tells me when I'm out there, people are like, yo, man, I'm Gnostic. I'm like, oh, you mean you're confused? <laughs> because you can't believe in this and that. And I believe this God's working a little bit in this. And, but I have knowledge, so I'm powerful. I'm like, well, if you don't have knowledge, what do you believe in if your knowledge is thrown all over the place? You either believe in something or you don't. Right? You either believe in Jesus or you don't. You don't say, well, I believe in Jesus, but I also got Buddha in my house and Hare Krishna. You, you can't. That's, that's, that is blasphemy in the highest form. You either serve who you serve or you don't. Uh, spoiler alert, the rest of the gods are dead. They're gone. Jesus Christ is alive. He's the only one. He is the way that should be right. And nobody comes to the Father that would be by him. Amen? It's all about Jesus. And so many scholars believe that during this time when, there, when all these things are going on, that the Apostle John is pushing back at all these false beliefs. He's sharing what they told him to share, right? And we live in a time, too, right now, where knowledge and data, right? We're just going to leave it at this. Knowledge and data are being used as weapons, are they not? Oh, yeah. People are taking knowledge, and they're taking data, and they are using them as weapons against other people. They're using them as weapons to bring forth a certain agenda or a certain ideology, and they're using it to overthrow things and to gain power in their own way. But how many of you know that God doesn't play that game? The will of God is always, it always trumps any other will. The will of God will always come through. You cannot stop the will of God, right? And so as people, as humans try to do these things, they don't realize that A, all they're doing is just cursing themselves and they're cursing our country, right? The other day I had a very unique conversation with somebody, and it's scary to think about, but I, I, I sat with this person. They were preaching to the choir, man, and they were like, listen, I disagree with this in our country. I disagree with this. I'm not happy with this. And when is God going to do this? And when is God going to do that? And I'm like, pump the brakes. And I'm like, you realize God's going to deal with us in the church first, right? Before God deals with any crooked politicians or anything, God's going to deal with the church. Because the Bible says judgment starts where? In the house of the Lord. So God's going to look at the church first and say, where have you been responsible for allowing this stuff to creep in? Where have you been responsible for allowing false lies to be integrated into the church? Where have you been responsible for not speaking up as a church on certain things? We're going to be held responsible first. Why? God's children. A loving father will chastise his kids first. And then in love and mercy, he'll go out and he'll try to persuade those through his spirit. And those that don't listen, we know what happens. It's, it's a choice. You're, you're away from God, and being away from God is a very dangerous thing. Because to be totally away from God and out of his covering is to be away from his promise of eternal life in heaven. Whether people like to hear it or not, there's two places. It's heaven and there's hell. And ultimately, we all make a decision where we go. But understand, the Holy Spirit as our comforter is here to lead us away from those decisions. And he's here to help lead us away from our, to save us from ourselves. Right? As we listen to what the, what the Lord is, what Jesus is telling him to reveal to us, as we listen to the Holy Spirit, he guides us in a path that takes us away from all those pitfalls so that we can keep going towards Jesus. Amen. True. Amen. Because to get lost in ourselves 
To get lost in hyper movement, to get lost in opinion, is a very dangerous thing. Too many churches today think, oh, well, I, I know this and I know that knowledge. It's the same as Gnosticism, like I said. You have pastors that are like, I know this and I know this and I've done this for so long. It. It's worthless if we're not walking in Jesus. It's worth, God can raise up a drug addict on the corner that could out preach any preacher in Denver right. and drop up a dime. Right. right? It's just like the parable of those who go out and work the vineyard. And one goes out and works and he, he starts 11 hours earlier. The other one starts two hours. They all get paid the same. You understand that as we all come to the Lord and do our part, God's not setting up a hierarchy like, yeah, brother, you've been here for 50 years. You're a CEO of my kingdom. You mean, no, no, no. We all come in equal, the same. In the Lord, and we all receive the same reward as we begin to walk forward in God, right? Because he's a faithful God. He's a loving God. He's a fair God. And let me just tell you something. Any gift that God gives you is a grand gift indeed. I don't believe heaven has any bad sides. Okay? Heaven is beautiful. But I will say that it's going to be very hard to get to heaven if we keep quenching the Holy Spirit and if we're not sensitive to him. It's very hard. Why? Because so many things get in the way. Pride, religiosity, all kinds of things, false movements, false doctrines. A lot of stuff gets in the way, and it can keep us from going to heaven. Because we think we know, but we don't. You know how many people I talk to, and they're like, and they're like, yeah, I don't need to read the Bible, and I don't need to do none of that stuff. Me and God have an understanding. I'm like, no. No, you don't have an understanding. Because if you understood God, he tells us to read his word and to study it. You guys remember last week, what did the word say? Last week it said that if you love me, obey my commandments. So how do you know how to obey his commandments? Because we study them and we read them. If we don't study the word of God, then we don't know what God expects from us. Right? Moving along. It's so important that we allow the Holy Spirit to come in and to move us into truth but not truth that we use to manipulate people or hold power over people. I said this the other day. A real leader doesn't sit back and, and bark orders at people and say do this and do that and then get mad when things don't go their way and stuff and hold grudges. That's not what a real leader does. A real leader will jump down with the people and just work with them. Let's do it. I'll do it with you. Let's go. A real leader knows how to go through what the people have gone through and walk with them so that we can all be on level ground. Amen? And so many times, many people will, will read the word void of the Holy Spirit. And how many of you know someone can be book smart? They can be very book smart, but they can lack a common sense. Do you guys know anybody that's like that? Yeah. They're very smart, but yet when it comes to common sense, it's like, you can't figure that out. Man. It's like simple, right? Just like that, in the same way, a lot of people know the word of God. But void of the Holy Spirit, they don't know the truth and the meat of what God's trying to tell them. You can quote scriptures till you're blue in the face, but if you're quoting them out of context, then it doesn't matter. You read them, you pray, you allow the Holy Spirit to lead you. That way you're getting what God wants for you, and you're not just, to, you're not just trying to create your own concoction. See, the Holy Spirit's role is to glorify the Son, receiving the Son's word and disclosing it to their followers. The issue is that many times... We move, we move our own saying, we, we say that, we start to move on our own, and we say, God, this is from you. I know it's from you, God. But in reality, it's based off of wants, and it's based off of emotions. Is God really telling you to do that? The proof is always in time, because time will show you that you made a mistake, and then things fall apart, or things will work out for the glory of them who love the Lord. Again, are we being led by the Holy Spirit? Or we're being led by emotion. Two totally different things. Very dangerous if you don't know how to disciple the two. John is not saying that the Holy Spirit will open up new information we haven't accessed necessarily. As a matter of fact, when we read in the scripture, when we read that Jesus told them that the Holy Spirit will guide them into new truths, the, the Lord was revealing much to them. There was stuff going on. The Lord was revealing them what was to come. Just like he did with, with the Apostle John or with the disciple John, right? Apostle John. Just like they did with him, the Lord revealed the book of Revelation and all kinds of things, things that he couldn't even understand at the time. That's how come when you read Revelation, sometimes you're like, what's going on here? Can you imagine the things that God was showing him in the future? How does a man that lives back in that time 
understand what's going on in today, it would be horrifying. It would be hard to understand, right? They didn't have Google. He couldn't just Google it and say, what are they talking about? They didn't have TV. They didn't have anything. They had donkeys. They had slippers. They had, there was nothing. But God revealed to them. So God revealed to them much things. And today, God reveals stuff to his prophets still. There's still men and women, I believe, that are called to be prophets. God reveals to them and he shows them stuff. But most of what the Holy Spirit is here to reveal to us is the word of God. As we read the word of God, he takes us into a deeper knowledge. He takes us into a deeper understanding. Right? Things that we, that we misinterpreted before because of our emotions... The Lord changes them. The Holy Spirit changes them and softens our heart so we can accept them as loving words from the Father and understand what he's trying to tell us. What do I mean? If you're an alcoholic and I'm preaching about, and I'm preaching about alcoholism, you're going to get offended because of the emotions, because of the flesh. You're like, whoa, I don't want to hear that, whatever. But as the Holy Spirit moves in you, you begin to understand that more. And you're like, Lord, I get it. I understand it now by your word. If you're a gossiper and someone preaches about gospel, a lot of times that offense rises up and you're like, Ooh, I don't want to hear that. And are you talking about me? And con the devil begins to put condemnation on you. But no, if you are filled with the Holy Spirit, the Lord begins to work on you and you begin to have conviction of the Holy Spirit. And you're like, Lord, this isn't right. Lord, help me to get over this. Any, anybody here dealing with something where you're like, Lord, please help me to conquer this. Lord, God. Help me to conquer this. I'm fighting with this. I, I don't like it. Right. We have to be honest with God. We have to be honest with the Holy Spirit. And we have to, we have to do our best not to quench him. Right? It's crazy. The Holy Spirit is there to help us, to guide us in understanding of the scriptures. But there's an image that comes to mind when I think about the Holy Spirit. Any, dad, any dads in here, or I know that today that a lot of dads are not present in their kids' life. But any dads or moms teach their kids to ride a bike in here? Raise your hand. <coughs> Right? You teach your kids to ride a bike. And so uh, I remember my dad in Loveland, Colorado, <laughs> holding my bike, going down a cul-de-sac. And I remember our big dog, Bear, getting out of the house. And he began to chase me. And as my dad was holding on to the, the seat, I began to pedal really fast. But I didn't know how to stop yet. So I just went as fast as I could to the end of the cul-de-sac. I just did a big old flip on the curb. <laughs> right? I need that guidance. But what do you do when you're teaching your kids how to ride a bike or how to swim? You guys know the drill, right? You hold the seat and you walk with them. And though they're shaky and they're going everywhere, they're gaining confidence little by little. And you walk with them and you hold them and you keep them in line, right? And the more that you do it, the better they get until there's a point that they're just like, they're like, okay, we got this, Dad. We're good. And what happens? Dad steps off and he, just, he, he runs by them to make sure that they're okay. But they begin to move. That's what the Holy Spirit does for us. As we read the word and as we pray and as we grow in the Lord, the Holy Spirit is there to help us and to guide us. That way when we begin to get shaky in our understanding or in our word, the Holy Spirit is there to straighten us out and make sure that we don't fall. Now in the process of growing in Christianity, we fall, don't we? We learn things. From, from the time that I first started really getting serious with God to now, I can tell you I've made so many mistakes where I thought that it, one thing was this way. And then the Lord slaps me around and he's like, you were totally wrong, dude. Puts me flat on my face. He's like, that's the way you got to go. And then you get running that way and what happens? We begin to lean on our own understanding, our own emotions, and everything else. And then we begin to go the wrong way again. The Lord puts us flat on our face again. He's like, no, that's not the way I told you to go. I told you to run this way. And that's why it's so important that we have the Holy Spirit and we submit. Because it's easy for a Christian to run the wrong direction their whole life. The wrong calling they think God gave them to run the wrong uh, decisions they think God told them, and it just causes damage and sets them back from where God wanted to bless them, where God wanted to take them. If only we would just submit, be patient, not jump around to everything, but say, Lord, just guide me. I listen to your Holy Spirit. Guide me. Lead me. Hold me. I trust you. That's not, that's not, that's not a very popular thing in today's day and age, to say, let's be patient in God. Let's just roll with it and trust you. Because we live in a microwave generation where everyone wants satisfaction very quick. Lord, I, Lord, I've been praying for two months. Show me what i got to do. Well, there's some people that have been praying for five years. There's some people that have been praying for 15 years and God didn't show them what to do. Lest I remind you of Joseph and Moses and others who waited 40 years to accomplish what they had to accomplish. It's about being steady. It's about being faithful. It's about staying the course, 
And it's about trusting God. Because if you trust God, you don't put a time limit on how he's going to work with you and when he's going to work with you. You just know that he's going to do it when it's time, as long as we do what we're supposed to do. Let me remind you again, if you love me, obey my commandments. And he says that those that obey his commandments, he is manifest in them. So how does Jesus manifest in us? When we begin to do the things that God asked us to do. When we begin to obey. When we begin to pray. When we begin to cut out the negativity. When we begin to tell God thank you instead of curse God for everything we don't have. When we quit making excuses and start running towards God, that's when he begins to bless us. The Holy Spirit will move in us. It's time for us to quit telling God how massive our problems are. And it's time for you to believe that your God is bigger than your problems. It's time for us to believe that God can conquer anything in our life. If we set our mind to it, be filled with the Holy Spirit and move in it, God will give us victory. We don't need to be Christian orphans. We don't need to be walking around as disabled Christians. Because God has given us the power to overcome and be conquerors and move out there and do what we got to do in our life. Here's the problem. Most Christians don't want to put in the work, but they want to reap the blessing. Most Christians, most Christians want to see the church grow, but no one wants to put in the work. Most Christians want to see their kids saved, but we don't want to put in the right parenting to make sure that we give them the right foundation. Most Christians want to see their marriages flourish, but most people don't want to put in the time to work on that marriage to make sure it works right. Most Christians want to grow in their speaking ability. Most Christians want to grow in their understanding of the Bible, but we don't have time to study. But we sure have time to flip through our phones, don't we? We sure have time to watch Netflix for hours on end, don't we? I'll tell you what, without the word of God, you guys, we're lost. Without the word of God, we can't make it. Romans 8, 26 through 27. I'm going to read this. Romans 8, 26 through 27. It says, In the same way the Spirit also helps our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we should, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. He who searches the hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because he intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. Listen to that. When, the, when you are filled with the Holy Spirit and when the Holy Spirit is just working on your behalf, he is groaning out to God. And it says it's words that are too deep, right? He knows, he knows you. He knows what you're going through, right? He knows Chad, what you're going through. He knows what you need. And so he, that, that deep feeling that you feel. Have you ever felt, bro, like no one understands? That you're like, dude, I'm hurting so bad, bro, and no one gets it. He knows that deep groaning in your heart for help. And so he's in there before the Lord, like, Lord, Chad needs you. Please help him, God, I beg you. In the most deep, 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 sincerest way, the Holy Spirit is there to intercede on our behalf. Right? He's there for us. He intercedes for us, right? Sister Dora, he intercedes for you. He knows your heart. He knows what you need. Edwin, he intercedes for you. He knows what you need in your heart. He stands before God saying, God, I know Edwin. I know what he's called to do. We need to do this. And the Holy Spirit moves for us, right? And notice what he says. He does it according to the will of God, according to the word. You see, many times we want God to move according to what we want. But if God gives us what we want, we'll be destroyed. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to be completely honest with you right now, just with some, with, with, with some things. Many times we're like, Lord, save this relationship. God, save this. Please make it work. And the Lord says, you're not even married and you're having sex. How can I save something that's not even under my name and under my blood? Oh, amen. Amen. Lord, please save me. Save this job. Help me out with this, God. Help me not to lose this. And the Lord says, how have you been with your money? Where have you given your money? Out at the bars or out doing this or that? He's like, and you haven't sown nothing to the kingdom. You pass by the homeless guy, but you won't pass by the liquor store. How do you want me to bless you there? You see, it's all about us understanding what God has given us, submitting to it. It says, in all things that we do, we honor God, right? In our jobs, we honor God. The Holy Spirit is in us to, to help us to have that understanding to say, God, thank you. And yes, we all complain, right? We all complain. I know it's natural. It happens. But I'll tell you what. 
the next time you want to complain about your job, thank God that you have a job, because finding a job in Colorado is hard right now. That's right. Anybody who has a good job in Colorado, you better hold on to it. Yeah. Right? We want to complain about our jobs, but we don't want to thank God for that and say, Lord, just use it. We want to complain about what we have, but the Lord's like, you, you, don't even, you don't even cherish me with what you have and honor me with what you have. How can I bless you with more if you don't even thank me with what you have? Amen. Trust me, I'm talking to myself here too, guys. We need to open up our eyes and say, Lord, we're too blessed. In America, we have too much. In America, we've been given too much. We're crybabies. Right? And then a little bit of persecution starts to kick up and people lose their minds. Let me tell you something, you guys. It's going to get worse. I've been saying this for months. It's going to get worse. Your relationship with Jesus and, and, and your relationship being filled with the Holy Spirit is going to determine whether you walk with your head high in the power of Christ or whether you're going to get ran, rushed out all over by Satan. Let me tell you, it's not God's desire that anybody in here get run over. But guess what? It's your choice. It's my choice if we want to allow the enemy to destroy us. 1 Corinthians 12, 7 through 11 says, and this is how the Holy Spirit moves. This is how the Holy Spirit gives gifts. This is how the Holy Spirit works. It says, but to each one is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, and to another the word of knowledge according to the same Spirit, and to another faith by the same Spirit. And to another gifts of healing by the one spirit. And to another the effecting of miracles. And to another prophecy. And to another distinguishing of spirits. Discernment. And to another various kinds of tongues. And to another interpretation of tongues. But one and the same spirit works in all these things. Distributing each one individually as God wills. God desires to give everybody spiritual gifts. That they can use. But this is why I tell you you need the Holy Spirit inside of you. Because without the Holy Spirit inside of you, it's easy to get caught up in hyper -movements. I know people that were not called to be prophets, that because they're part of a huge prophetic movement, they think they have to learn how to prophesy and go out there and prophesy. You can't learn how to prophesy. The Holy Spirit comes upon you, and when he comes upon you, you speak in boldness, and it's God's word. It's not our word. We can't take credit for it. Oh, that guy is such a great prophet. The words are coming from God, not from us. Do you praise the glass that keeps you? Do you praise the glass that keep you hydrated, or do you praise the water? All we are is a vessel. The real stuff comes from Jesus. He's our living water. He's our life. The Holy Spirit keeps us. He gives us gifts, and without the Holy Spirit, we can make a mockery of these gifts. Let me be very honest. There's many people today that don't want to see the move of the Holy Spirit no more because church people have made a mockery of it. Because they misuse it. Because they go out there and throw it around like it's nothing, like it's not holy. The, the works of the Holy Spirit are sacred and holy and should be held with the highest reverence. When you feel God move upon you, you move it. Amen. Go ahead. We need to reverence them. And as God moves, he will give everybody what is called, right? Some of you guys, God is giving you the, the gift of praying for people, for healing. God is giving you that passion to go out there in the hospitals and to pray. For others of you, I know some of you guys that God is giving you the gift of prophecy. And how do I know? Because when you say something in the Lord, it comes true. You want to know how to, how to tell who's a real prophet and who's not? It's always the fruition of what they say. If they're a real prophet and it's from God, the word will come to pass because God's not a liar. But if they're a false prophet, they'll speak things out that won't come. As a matter of fact, I was talking to a pastor um, of a big church, and I'm not going to mention his name out of respect for him. Um, but I was talking to a pastor of a big church, and, and he, was, he was sharing with me, like a mentor, he was sharing with, with me and another brother um, some things that he went through when he took over his church. And he was like, there was a lot of things that weren't in line when I took this church over. He's like, and one of them was, uh, one day I walked in and they were having a prophetic conference. He's like, and this lady was teaching them how to prophesy. And she was saying, okay, well, first you start with something real general. You know, just start, like, I'm feeling something in your home. 
And then he, he, she was saying, as you keep mentioning stuff, if you see them begin to tear up or shake, you know you hit it, start to hammer on it. And they were teaching people how to prophesy pretty much with a fortune cookie theology. You just throw out random stuff until you see someone react to it, and then you're like, oh, yeah, that's it. That's it, right? And, you know, and he said he said he was, he was grieved. He was grieved by this. And he told them, never again will you guys do this in my church. This is a mockery. You don't do this. The Holy Spirit is sacred. You do not make a mockery of the things of God. When God decides to move in a prophetic word, he will call upon those that he has made prophets, and they will speak forth, and it will come with power. But that's not just something you throw around to teach everybody, because not everybody is a prophet. Not everybody works in the gift of healing. Not everybody works in, 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 in what they say in, 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 their, in, their, uh, in their actions. Not everyone moves in that spirit of of discerning, uh, being able to discern spirits and see things in the spiritual realm. God has blessed everybody with specific gifts based on how God created you. And so it's important that we pray and seek God for what our spiritual gift is and not look after everyone else and desire, and desire what to have what they have. I remember a time in my life where I had, where I had uh, people that were like, oh man, you gotta work in all those gifts, Dave. Like, I'm gonna teach you how to pray for the sick and heal them. I'm gonna teach you how to pray. You gotta work in them all. And I'm like, that, but that's not what the Bible says. Now, can God do that? Sure he can. God can do whatever he wants to. I'm sure there's people that are in doubt and just hammer all those, but I'd rather just trust God and let him bring things in the Holy Spirit as he sees yeah. it. Because yeah. you know what? I'm not a prophet. But God has given me prophetic words to use. What he wants. I have no healing power. But the rare times that God has told me to go and pray for someone for healing, I've listened because the Holy Spirit is telling me to. What I'm telling you is, is that the way you'll know how to use your gifts is to stay sensitive to the Holy Spirit and let him speak to you. And he will tell you what to do. And you can always go with confidence that God will accomplish what he wants to accomplish. Do you know why so many people are hurt in this world today when it comes to the Holy Spirit? Because you have pastors for years that have walked in and prayed based on emotion. Walk into the hospital every time and you're like, heal it, you're healed in the name of Jesus, you're healed. And then they die. No, no, no. It is our heart's desire that they would be healed, right? And if God speaks to you, once again, listening to the Holy Spirit, if God speaks to you that they're going to be healed, then you pray healing over them. But if I don't hear the Holy Spirit telling me anything, you know how I always pray? My God, I pray for comfort for them. I pray for God to help them carry this burden. And I pray for God's will to be done. Because how do I know that God's will is for them to go be home with him? The greatest healing that we can ever have is to go home with Jesus, right? So how do I know that they're not suffering so bad that God's like, why would they stay here and suffer? I can take them right now. Or, or how does God know that if he doesn't take someone right now at this moment, 10 years down the line, they might backslide, die in a car accident, and go to hell. God, in his mercy and grace, will take us when he knows it's time. <clears throat> now, sometimes do we allow the devil to steal that from us? Sure, we do when we're away from God. When you reject God and you don't want to hear it, sometimes, but sometimes the Lord just, you made, your, you made your way. But like I said, that's why it's so important that we walk in the Holy Spirit. And we understand what he's doing. You know why? Why come to church if we're not going to come and be seeking to be filled by the Holy Spirit? Why come to church if we're not coming to hear from God and we're not coming to just seek the truth and let God change us? Why even come to church, you guys? You might as well stay home. If we're just coming to hear a word to make us happy for a couple days, what good is that? We need to submit to God so he can change us. If you love Jesus, obey his commandments. Does that mean that all of us are going to bat 100? No, we all make mistakes. But when we make mistakes, thank God for the Holy Spirit that brings yeah. conviction that says, you know you were wrong, Dave. Yes. Go apologize. You know what you said was wrong. Go apologize. Some of you guys are going to deal with this next one. You know what you wrote on Facebook was wrong. Go delete it. Man, that happens to me all the time. Go delete it. I'm like, Lord, but it's true. I don't care if it's true, man. Just go and delete it. Right? Let the Holy Spirit lead us and guide us, and he will guide us into our all, all truth. So we make sure that we're not sowing in the flesh, but we're sowing in the spirit. Because to sow in the flesh, we're never going to get anything from that. Okay, very quickly. Very quickly here. The helper leads us into an honest 
communion with God. Similar to how we have communion, we want open communication between children and parents. Listen, how difficult is it for a parent to hear from a child and the child tells the parent how the parent has hurt him and what the parent has done to them? And this, and what, what happens? The parent in their authority right away wants to make excuses, put their foot down, shut up the child, right? And, and not listen at times. I've been guilty. Has anybody else been guilty of that or am I the only one in here? Right? Right away, in authority, and you're like, I don't want to hear it. I don't want it. I don't want nothing. I don't. But if we learn from the Holy Spirit, what does the Holy Spirit do to us? The Holy Spirit listens. Despite how you want to defend your case, parents, when your children come to you, or husbands and wives, despite how you want to defend yourself and make a defense, it's so important that you stop and you listen because your child or your spouse is being vulnerable with you allowing you in, so you must listen, submit yourself, help them with godly wisdom to navigate these emotions. It's easier said than done. But God, if we watch God, if we learn from the great teacher, God has every right to defend himself, but notice that when God's justice comes down, it comes down. But if you notice, he's, he, first, he listens thoroughly. Through his spirit, he shows us great compassion, and he actually employs some of the most impressive listening skills you could ever have. The Lord will just listen to you. You can complain. You can bash. You can, the Lord will just listen to you. And then by his spirit, he's just like, you need to change this. This isn't right. What are you doing? Come to me. He comes to you in scripture. But at that point, it's up to us whether we really want to listen or not. We have two choices. Either submit and listen or reject God and we keep walking in the same disappointments. I don't know about you, but maybe there's some people in here that you're tired of walking in circles. You're tired of the same disappointments in life. And you're like, Lord, I want to get closer to you. But here's the deal. If you want to get closer to God, then you need to change what you've been doing if it's not working. What do I mean? If you're trying to get closer to God and you never remove the bar scene from your life, maybe you better make that adjustment. If you're trying to get closer to God, but you're still looking at pornography, maybe you better get rid of that. If you're trying to get closer to God, but you still gossip every chance you get, maybe you need to get rid of that. If you're trying to get closer to God, but yet you hold so much anger and unforgiveness, maybe you need to give that to God. If you're trying to get close to God, but your eyes wander at every piece of meat that comes in front of you, maybe you need to try giving that to God. You understand what I'm saying? We can't get closer to God while holding on to the things that have always held us back. If we want things to change, then we need to move forward in faith and allow the Holy Spirit to work those things out of our life. And when they work out of our life, keep them gone out of our life. Don't invite them back in. Oh, but life would be boring. Life isn't boring. I don't know about you. I'd rather, I'd rather live a life where I can lay my head on my pillow at night and go to sleep with a clean conscience than live in all kinds of sinful fun and live in turmoil the rest of my life wondering if I'm going to make it to heaven. I don't know about you, but peace is so much better than prosperity to me. Peace, and the only peace that God can give us. Amen. Amen. Amen? We need to faithfully study, faithfully study the world's words so we can reveal to us more and more. Romans 5, 8, how do we know that God will be with us no matter what we go through? How do we know that God will be there? That while we were still sinners, Christ displayed his love to us, that he sent his son to die for us. While we were still sinners, God sent his son to die for us. How many of you in here right now, think about it honestly, how many of you right now would send your child to get murdered brutally for a stranger? So if you want to know how much God loves you, keep that in perspective. He loved you so much, he sent his son to be brutally murdered for us because he loved us. Amen? The honest communication and illumination of scriptures is not just for our own sake. But the purpose of being led into all truth is not to hold on to the knowledge, but to give it away. If you are reading your word in here, and you're praying, and God is moving in you, it's not for you just to keep it in your own home, in your own heart, and never give it away. God gives you that knowledge so you can go out, so we can go out there and share with people, share with family, share with our coworkers, yeah. share the love of Jesus. Because if we don't share with them, how will they ever know? That's right. yeah. That's right. And I promise you one thing. The more you pour out and go back to God, he's faithful to fill you. He's faithful to keep you going. But let me put a side note or warning in here like I always like to do. If you're out there trying to preach to people all the time, 
and you're out there trying to do stuff, but you yourself aren't reading the word and really playing and submitting yourself, you're going to burn out, go dry, fall flat on your face, Satan's going to run up. Why? Because you're not doing what you're telling them to do. Don't tell people to give their life to God if you can't even give your life to God. Don't tell people to be faithful with their, with their money and faithful with this and that if you can't even be faithful with your stuff. Don't, don't, don't go and counsel people to be faithful in their marriage if you can't even be faithful in your marriage. Don't go and tell people how to raise their kids if you're failing your own children. You know what I'm saying? It's up to us to be real and allow the Holy Spirit to have us look in that spiritual mirror and say, Lord, where am I failing? Where am I failing? Right? We can do this all we want to. But the reality of it is, we look in the mirror and we say, God, where am I failing? Because who does it start with? It's us. We need to become the change we desire to see. Well, I want to see this in the church. Okay, get active and do it then. Help out. Well, I want to do this. I want to see this happen. Okay, get active. Do it then. Don't wait for other people. Get active. Be the change you desire to see. Very quickly, as the praise team makes their way up here. 2 Corinthians 3.14. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Paul ends his prayer noticing, putting emphasis on communion with the Holy Spirit. It's important that we have communion with the Holy Spirit. It's important that we love on God. It's important that we invite him in. It's important that when we're praying, we're like, Lord, Jesus... Show me how, you're, how I'm quenching the Holy Spirit. Show me what I got to do so I can hear Him more. Remove distractions from my life. Right? John 14, 26. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, He will teach you all things and will bring to your remembrance things that I have said. If you really want to get good at Scripture memory and you really want to get good at remembering what you read in the Bible, be filled by the Holy Spirit and He'll help you remember, I promise. I don't know about you guys, but I got... I have a hard time remembering stuff, so I have to pray and ask God to remind me. Is there anybody else here that walks down the stairs already and you stand in the kitchen and you're like, what did I come down here for? <laughs> Is that happening to anybody else? I'll tell you what. Yeah, I was going to say something. We won't go there. Okay? Luke 12, 11 through 12. Okay? Now when they bring you to the synagogues and magistrates and authorities, do not worry about how, you look, about how you should answer or what you should say, for the Holy Spirit will teach you in that very hour what to say. So the Holy Spirit is our helper. He leads us, and as we pray and as we read the Word, we don't need to worry so much about performance. Listen, Christianity is not a performance-based lifestyle. Christianity is about trusting in God. And when you go before someone prayed up, you can trust the Holy Spirit will give you the right words. I've told this to lots of people before, but I'll continue to tell you. Every Sunday before I come to church, it doesn't matter how long I've done this, every Sunday before I come to church, I am afraid. And I'm like, Lord, I'm nervous. God, I don't want to say the wrong thing. Lord, help me to understand this right. But as soon as you get in that mode and you begin to pray, the Holy Spirit takes over and you get a boldness that's not your own, but it's a boldness from the Holy Spirit where God is like, I will lead you and guide you. Know that God will guide what you say, I promise you. If you're going to pray for someone, you're like, I don't know what to do. Submit yourself to the Holy Spirit and let him guide you. And he will guide you on what you need to say. Right? We don't need to fabricate stuff to get amens. We don't need to fabricate stuff to make a church grow. We don't need to fabricate stuff to make ourselves look holier. All we need to do is listen to the Holy Spirit. And by God's power, he will display who our God really is. And that's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That's the God that sent his son to die for us. And that's the God who is and was and is to come. He is the great I am. He is the one that will conquer, that has conquered Satan already. And he's the one that's coming back soon. Are we ready to receive him as his bride? We need the Holy Spirit in our, in our very depths of our being if we are going to survive what's coming. Many people are waiting for a Cinderella story. You guys, there is no Cinderella story. There's, you're walking on the path of God. The enemy's going to come against it. We'll be victorious in Christ, but the cost is going to be much. Let me ask you, how many of you are willing to go through the grinder to see God's will be done? We need to be. But let me tell you something. Some people are getting scared. You're like, oh, man, I'm never coming to church again. No, 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 no. Here's the thing. You're going to go through the grinder either way. You think the devil's just going to let you go because you don't serve God? Newsflash, the devil hates you. 
because you were created in God's image. He's trying to kill you. People that are Satan worshipers, it's the most ludicrous thing in the world because they're praising the person that wants to kill them. But we serve Jesus Christ. We love him. You either just live in the world and then the world tear you up and spit you out and then you die and then you graduate to eternal hell or you fight as a soldier of God filled with the Holy Spirit. He'll give you peace. He'll walk you through every situation and though you'll go through battles, the goal is to someday hear someone say, come in my good and faithful servant for those yours is the kingdom of heaven. That's the end game, right? That's what we want to hear. The very last thing is that the Holy Spirit, if we listen, is faithful to tell us what to do and not to do. This is very important because in our Christian walk, many times we're like, anything that has to do with God is going to be a good thing. So I'm not going to even pray about it. I'm going to go to San Antonio and preach on the streets, and I'm going to go over here, and I'm going to go to the bars, and you haven't prayed about it, you haven't fasted, you haven't brought it to God. How do you know that's what God wants you to do? Well, because I see that brother in the church over there doing it. Well, maybe God put on his heart and called him. Not everybody in this church. This church is not called to do certain things that other churches are called to do. God is putting the vision of this church, what we are supposed to do, and we must stay faithful to it. But not everyone's called to feed the homeless. Not everyone's called to be a motorcycle ministry. Not everyone's called to be in the gang ministry. Not everyone's called to go out and witness the prostitutes. Not everyone's called to marriage counseling. You see what I'm saying? Find what God has called you to do and be faithful to it. Don't fantasize about what other people do and be like, oh, I want that power. I want that. That's their anointing. Do not covet. That's their anointing. Be faithful with the anointing God gave you and, be, and just run with it and let God use it. As a matter of fact, in Acts 16, 6 through 8, the Lord speaks and it says, now when they had gone through, I can't even say this word, Bargeria, and the region of Galatia, they were forbidden by the Holy Spirit to preach the word in Asia. Listen, the Holy Spirit forbid the Apostle Paul and them to go and preach in Asia. And then after they came to Messiah, they tried to go in Bithynia, but the Spirit did not permit them. So passing by Messiah, they came down the trails, right? And I probably murdered all of those words, but it's okay, we'll talk about that later, okay? <laughs> But the point I'm trying to make is here is that the Apostle Paul and them, they could have been walking in their own understanding. They could have said, I'm going to stop here. I'm going to stop here. I'm going to go here. But instead, they were submitted to the Spirit. They were prayed up. And what did the Holy Spirit tell them? He said, you're not allowed to go preach the gospel in Asia. You don't think God had his own reason for doing that? Because God had already told Paul that he would stand before Rome, that he would stand before the great ones, and he would tell them about Jesus Christ, and he would declare the Lord, and he would be martyred for it. God knew, the Apostle Paul knew what his mission was. So the Holy Spirit says, no, you can't go to Asia. And no, you can't go to that town. Stay on the path that I told you. That's why I say it's so important for us not to be emotional Christians. Because many times we're like, oh, well, if it has to do with God, it's got to be good either way, right? Well, you might not lose nothing. All you're doing is deterring the great things that God has called you to do. Because many times, God needs you somewhere, and by our own little fleshly diversions, we are wasting time getting the people that God has called us to get to to help. We need to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit so that we walk in exactly what God wants us to walk in. That's not an easy thing to hear, right? Because people want to do what they want to do. Oh, don't tell me what to do. I'll just make sure that it's from God. Make sure we're led by the Holy Spirit. You want to know a good way to make sure you're being led by the Holy Spirit? Really get down and do a serious fast. Fast and pray to the Holy Spirit can reveal to us what we need to do. And I want to promise everybody something here right now. If you submit yourself to God, read His Word, ask to be filled with the Holy Spirit, and you begin to push out push away those things that have been holding you back, I promise you God will begin to draw you closer to Him. But listen, you can't just come to church on Sundays and Wednesdays. That's not good enough. You're going to starve to death. You have to read your Bible during the week. You have to pray during the week in your, in, in, on your own. Your personal time with Jesus is probably the most important time. 
Give him the time he deserves without distractions. Give God the time he deserves without distractions. If you're going to be in church, if you're going to study your Bible, if you're going to be, remove distractions so you can hear what the Holy Spirit has to tell you. Amen? Amen. Very quickly, I'm going to have my father come up. And today we're going to take communion. And he's going to lead us in communion. Amen? I love you guys. Trust in God. Seek things that are his. Ask to be filled by the Spirit. And let's be real honest with ourselves what we have to change this week. Amen? That's our homework. Many years ago, as a presbyter for the San Luis Valley in the Assemblies of God, I was the overseer of all the Assembly of God churches from Salida, Colorado, all the way to the border of New Mexico. And uh, had a very good friend there by the name of Gil Lucero. Uh, his daughter's here today. Sister Lucero, would you stand? God bless you. God bless you. David. David. She found us on Facebook, on Google, on Google. and uh, she's going to be a regular. Praise God. <laughs> Communion. The Bible says that Christians, listen, very close, Christians partake of communion in remembrance of the blood and the body, the body and the blood of Jesus, which was poured out at the cross. Let me repeat that, because most Christians don't even understand what communion is about. The Bible says that Christians partake of holy communion as remembrance of the body, the blood of Jesus poured out on the cross of Calvary. Holy Communion. We know that it is God's way of expressing what transpired in his life. The hurt, the pain, that he went through to purchase our eternity. He is truly a friend that sticks closer than a brother. But that wasn't all. He also poured himself out to express his love for us. His love for us. So those that are going to that's that communion, would you come? Praise God. I want to take communion this way today. Pastor Dave mentioned about things that we need to push away in our life. Things that we need to push away that get in the way of what God truly has for you and I. We just think, you know, when the pastor mentioned what he, what he mentioned about coming down from the bedroom, down the stairs to the kitchen, and all of a sudden you forgot, why am I here? What am I here for? And that sounds like individuals who are starting to get a little bit of a mental thing going on. Huh? And they ask themselves, what, Leonard? You're going to think about it the year after. Usually when you're older, you go down and say, what am I here after? Yeah. <laughs> if you want to think about the hereafter, as an older person, when you get down, you ask yourselves, what am I here after? Oh, boy. I always let Leonard take me in on that stuff. 
But listen, you all know what needs to be pushed away. You all know what needs to be pushed away. I know what needs to be pushed away. I don't need a prophet to reveal it to me. I don't need a friend to tell me. I don't need a, a church member to tell me about it. You and I know what it is that is getting in the way of being all I need to be in Christ Jesus. Jesus is coming soon, church, whether you want him or not. It could happen today. It could happen tomorrow. Jesus is coming. When are you going to let it go? When are you going to push that away? Whatever it is, I don't need to, to mention the whole uh, chronology of, of things that Pastor Dave shared. You know, oh, come on, Pastor, I gave the Lord 99% of my life. I can keep that little 1% for me. No, you can't. No, you can't. That little 1% might keep you out of heaven. We need to know that. We need to understand that. Heavenly Father, I come before your presence and I pray. I pray that you would move in a mighty way in this congregation this morning that we would know, that we would know without a doubt, Father God, that once again, and I regret that we do it once a month, we should do communion more often. But Father God, once a month we have the opportunity, the privilege, Lord God, to put those things away that continue to get in the way. And Father God, I bind the enemy in the name of Jesus. The enemy that deceives us into thinking that we need that thing, that we need that habit, that we need that thing that we do. Father God, in the name of Jesus, I pray that we would push away today as we come forward and take communion and truly appreciate the significance of communion in my life as a believer. And I want you to use that taking of communion today to tell the Lord, take this habit from me, Father. Take this sin from my life. Take, Father God, whatever attitude that I need to get rid of, whatever sin I need to get rid of whatever attitude, oh God, I need to get rid of whatever addiction, Father, that is in the way, Father God, whatever lifestyle, whatever thing, Father God, it is that is in the way. I ask, Father God, as I take communion today, I make a commitment to release it to you in the name of Jesus. Thank you for the word today, Father God, for we know that we know without a doubt that it is the Holy Spirit that lights up our soul like a flashlight to reveal to us what we need to get rid of. And as you acknowledge Him in your life, and as the Lord reveals to you in your heart what it is you need to push away, come on up and get the cup so that we can take communion in remembrance of the sacrifice that Jesus carried out for us. Oh.